welcome to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from, and the businesses, and more importantly, the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Hi, welcome back. Uh, I'm recording this episode in mid-September 2020. And the forecast tomorrow, in the south of England at least, is 26 degrees. That means bars and restaurants with terraces still seem to be busy and chatting to hotel operators out of the cities, they all seem very busy too. Portugal, France, Spain and numerous other countries are in essence closed. So the staycation does indeed seem to be a thing at the moment, particularly for anyone with self-catering accommodation. But COVID cases are soaring, tests have become really hard to get hold of, the rule of six has been brought in, and I think in the sector we're all still very nervous about a potential plummet in consumer confidence to go out to bars and restaurants. And that rent moratorium is nearly over, and we are, are we two weeks away from catastrophe as tenants cannot pay their rents? Well, it looks like we'll know the answer very soon, since still no support on this from national government. So that's the backdrop to hospitality this week. But with all that going on, I was exceptionally lucky to get an invite up to Le Manoir Croissizon, the home of Raymond Blanc and executive chef Gary Jones. Now, I think most people with a keen interest in incredible food and hospitality in general are aware of Le Manoir and its reputation. They've churned out over 30 Michelin-starred chefs. They've had two Michelin stars themselves since 1981, and their organic certified kitchen gardens are legendary. I was very excited to finally get to go and visit, and they have very much lived up to expectations. Helped by a beautiful sunny day, the hotel and the grounds looked stunning. Gary Jones was generous with his time, chatting freely and took the time to take me on a tour of the gardens and the poly tunnels where his enthusiasm and knowledge and happiness to share his thoughts and experiences typified the generosity of so many who work in hospitality. Now Gary's had a fascinating journey from working at La Manoir on two separate occasions, most recently for 21 years, to working for Richard Branson on Necker Island and having received Michelin star accolades from scratch at two other venues. He's also a black belt in karate, practices yoga and is a busy dad to three teenage daughters. Our chat goes from Gary's own kitchen garden, hunting snails by torchlight at 1am, to the symbiotic relationship with his team and the garden team at Le Manoir, to the change in diets and using less butter and cream in the kitchens, a great story about how Gary ended up working on Necker Island, and even the genius of Raymond Blanc, or RB as he's known, and the contrasting skills they both bring to the kitchen and the development of so many of the world's best chefs. For me, this was another great highlight of my podcast journey so far, and I really hope you enjoy the conversation. If you do, or if you've enjoyed others, can you please do me a very quick favour? Can you scroll down on the device you are listening to, to the review section, and click on five stars? Even better, hit the subscribe button and leave a few words in the comments. Just that little action in return for this free podcast means I can get better guests to say yes when I randomly get in touch asking for a conversation. And that means better podcast episodes for both you and I to enjoy. Thanks. You're lovely. Enjoy the chat. Gary Jones, thank you so much for sparing the time to be on the podcast today. Hugely appreciated and uh, nice. I'm finally doing some more face to face, having been locked out for COVID. Can you just explain to people listening, where in the world are we, Gary? We are in the world in Oxfordshire. Um, a place called Great Milton, and we're at the Memoir, uh, the Memoir Cat Saison. Yeah, we are, which um, I, I was saying before we started, this feels like a, a mecca and a temple of hospitality, because congratulations on, on the reputation that you guys have here. I don't know, it's just mind-blowing. 1981, was it? I mean, two Michelin stars since then, is that correct? Exactly, yeah, and Raymond, Raymond Blanc's uh, baby, you know, he came 
um, you drove past the place and fell in love with it. And um, you know what you see is 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 what you get since. You know he's a phenomenal chap. And uh, the first thing he we're sat in the middle of the in the glass house now in the gardens. The first thing he he uh, focused on when he got here was the garden really? know, for obvious reasons. And, and what was it when he found it all those years ago? Then was it was it like this or it was, was it? no? It was, a, well, it was a private house right. um, and um, you know in in disrepair. And um, yeah, he fell in love with the thing, and uh, you know, and it's evolved ever since, which which is lovely. And, yeah, uh, well, it's know, evolved in reputation. It, yeah, it's evolved in a incredible way. So we are we are sat in uh, in your, I was going to say little greenhouse, but that's uh, compared to my greenhouse, it's about forty times the size, and we are surrounded by produce in every direction, which I guess is is the reputation you guys have. So we'll start with the garden. You know, just how important is having your own produce to all that you do? Yeah. Well, it's the epicenter, and uh, I think um, you know the inspiration comes from the season, from the garden, from the variety, from the flavours, from the taste. And um, you know, every week we'll do a walk around with the garden and see what is peaking now. You know, so it should be on the menu, and also what's coming up, so we can plan the, the menu for the week after the the week after that and the month ahead. You know, so it's good. And obviously, um, there are seasonal variations in that. The weather can, but you can have a really wet spring or you know, a, a really cold um, winter and th- things like that. So they vary in week to week, but generally there's a pattern to it as well. As nature's got a pattern, and you make sure your food and your menu, um, you know, mimics that pattern really. Yeah. So nature is is, you know, is everything, and the garden is is the epicenter of that. Yeah. So must be the dream place to work. Because you've been here for well, you've been here twice, haven't you? But but yeah. most recently, twenty one years. Yeah. Yeah, where, where else could you go? I suppose this must be pretty unique as a chef to have this. It is unique, and it's a, it's a very special place. And I think, um, yeah, leading the team in, in in the kitchen and you know having the you know the the use of these products is just phenomenal. Yeah, it's it's something else. Yeah. It's inspirational. Yeah. To to walk it and see and and trying to use every little piece that you possibly can. Um, you know, and if you can't use it all you're turning into an oil or you're drying it for a a little rub or whatever it may be so yeah yeah there's lots lots of inspiration from the garden and can you use it all because it's a big old space isn't it? how many acres is it there are there's like um i think it's eight in total with the the fields yeah because you've got an orchard as well haven't you we have indeed yeah so the uh, the orchard went in a few years ago and again it's um it's coming on it's very young orchard right um but there's the you know there's lots of um, apple varieties but the history of the apple as well in the UK, as what Raymond has looked into with some experts as well, and uh, we've brought back some old varieties, which is great. So varieties that were, you know, to the county, and um, you know, the pears and the, the apples and the, you know, the plums. It's all, it's all out there. And yeah, I think you've spotted Raymond this morning checking the I pears out on the, the, saying, on the like, south facing wall. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. thought I thought it might be like a Madam Madam Two Swords kind of replica because I came around the corner. And I thought, that looks like Raymond there. And I thought, who's this madman yeah. who's literally outside the walls of, of the premises? Yeah. And uh, he was rummaging through the pairs on, yeah. on, the, on the outside walls. And then I looked yeah. over to the left, and sure enough, there was his smart car with his personalised number plate. Yeah. And then he moved. And I was like, wow, it really is Raymond. I was yeah. like, yeah, is he, is he always there? I didn't know if he knew I was coming, uh, Karen. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, so he was, he was out there checking. They were perfect. And he's just, uh, just finished a book, I think, all about apples and pears, isn't he? And the, and the British history and, uh, and why, when you go to the supermarket, are all the apples from South Africa when we have... We grow so many. It's, it's beyond comprehension, isn't it? It really, it really is a shame, yeah. And um, I was in an orchard in Kent on the weekend with friends, and uh, they've got a pretty huge orchard um, for a family home. And there's so many apples on the trees, but it, it, it's going to cost too much to get the apples off, to get the pickers to take the apples off. So I came back with eight huge bags full of apples. Really? Yeah, um, coming back to Raymond and his book, yeah, he'd, he'd finished um, a book on Kew and Gardens, which was fabulous. Then also he's working on another one as well now, which is cooking um, with speed, you know, because most people don't have uh, that much time, but also with nutrition in mind as well. Right. You know, and health. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, I'm just laughing at the thought of Raymond cooking on speed because he talks so quickly anyway. I can't imagine. I can't imagine him giving any... I'll try to follow what he was... Uh, cooking at speed, at not speed. on speed. Okay, good. Because uh, yeah. that would be a dangerous combination in Raymond's world, I think. I mean, yeah, I've not seen him talk a few times. Uh, he's he doesn't need that. No. Um, organic accreditation for the gardens as well, is that correct? Yeah, again, every year since the, um, it's been open. So we work very closely with the Soil Association and to get organic status, huge amounts. You've got to prove where everything comes from. You've got to, the traceability of the seed the varietals, all of those things, because you can get 
quicker, faster growing seeds and things, but they're not organic. So we focus on the organic and uh, slow yeah. growing um, for flavors, basically. So there's a lot of... Uh, which, is, which is brilliant. It must add an element, as, as a, a recent kitchen gardener, and having seen probably 80% of my produce this year eaten by slugs, uh, aggravating me and then doing a bit of reading and realizing that the perfect scenario is where your garden becomes in balance and the hedgehogs eat the slugs and the birds eat the aphids and all this kind of stuff high risk in a restaurant i presume because if you lose the crop you know it's, des it's designed to go straight into your space does it does it does it make it harder and, and it, have you had sort of times where you have lost crops due to uh, not being able to use yeah there's stuff? certain there's certain years where you got a lot of black fly or you do get a lot of thing but you've got to take it before <laughs> before the uh, little critters do basically mm -hmm. at home i use little beer traps as well which might you might give it a try yeah do they work um, yeah absolutely do they for you for slugs, slugs, slugs and snails, snails yeah, really? yeah yeah because I read they're, that. So they're voracious when they when they kick in so i'm I, i've been found with my my wife says what are you doing and i'm there at you know like one o'clock in the morning yeah. looking for the that slug that has taken the the tips of my dwarf beans away you know won't allow the um, the bean to grow so I was yeah I'm out there a lot in the, in the dark it's good to hear um, that because because I, I told my wife that when I was looking for my head tours the other day and she said what are you doing I said I'm, I'm genuinely considering yeah, getting out of the night like, she just looked at me like I was insane but yeah. it does actually if you do it Gary I can definitely get away with it get it done get it done it's okay. good fresh air can you use rubbish beer I don't have to use those nice uh, IPAs I've got in the fridge well I've got no definitely not but I've got some lovely daughters who often put a beer in the freezer to chill and then forget about it and then Brilliant. I've got this beer with a you know that frozen yeah. neck that's the stuff i use i use their lagery stuff they don't go near the ipa no, do they not no, okay no. good it's like, i've been wondering <laughs> what to do with all that all that naff beer so uh, yeah that's perfect friends with a sense of humor who turn up with with something rubbish um is it just fruits and vegetables any livestock here as well or no livestock um again it gets very complicated when you you know you've got the the bird flu which would then if we did get you know if we had chickens and you've got to consider bird flu where there'd be an exclusion zone and that was not be good for business same as <laughs> same as um you know all livestock again you're in a different category when you do those things so um so we we at the moment don't do that yeah um okay. but it's, it's fruit vegetables herbs yeah. uh, salads leaves all of those things and presumably it gives you the opportunity because there's no point just growing carrots and potatoes you can get those from all over the place i, I yeah. presume it means you can focus on some quite niche or unusual or stuff that, that that degrades quite quickly do you have any sort of favorite things that you get from the garden here that you wouldn't be able to get at the supermarket I suppose? um there's there's so many little things we'll do a little, little walk around later and yeah, you, you'll, you'll see different things i think it's get capturing it at the moment um it's absolutely ready and cut just before the service which which is great you know you, we talked about corn earlier on and the and the starch turning uh, very very quickly from from when it's uh, cut it's the fact that it's cut by the garden team and brought to the kitchen then it's you know into that service and then we cut again for the evening again for the little herbs and and, and things so and the flowers so you've got uh, the ultimate freshness basically is what yeah. you're looking at must be quite a partnership then presumably with your head gardener and, and you because a gardener does doesn't necessarily know i remember my father-in-law used to do a lot of sort of kitchen gardening and i take my, my chefs out to see him and uh, it was fascinating seeing him chat because he he would just want to you know grow something amazing but didn't really realize how it was going to be cut presented used in a dish yeah yeah it must must be quite an interesting partnership it right. is it's good but what we what we try and do and we try our best to do because it's back-breaking work in the garden and what i've tried to do is kind of sync the two teams together because you've got because i've been um my started my own garden at home as well and i've the the knowledge you've got from that, I think it's really valuable for a chef because you know when things are ready, you know when things are ripe, you know when you've got to use things before the slugs get to them or all of those things. So I bring the guys down once once a week to spend an hour or an hour or two. And at the moment, the weed in, but they're in amongst it. And that's the main thing, you're in it. And then actually, once they've done that hour in the garden, they go, wow, that was great, I loved it. They're in the weather, the bending, the stretching, you know, the seeing the thing, the touching the soil, which is really, really important stuff. And if you can do that, which is great. And equally, we bring the garden team. I was just going to ask that. Yeah. To the kitchen to taste the dishes that we've done, which is great. Do taste them or, or not, not oh, cook oh, them? Go, no, no, taste them. Right, you don't to get them in there. Them. Not to cook them. They, they see them getting cooked. Okay. Um, but then we, we show them what we do with their hard work because once you've put, you know, you've selected the seed, planted the seed, nurtured the seed, once it's grown to where you want it to be, what we do with it at the next stage and the importance of getting harvesting it that big rather than that big with a variety you know and what we do with it on the plate afterwards and 
you know that's the important bit and if the chefs can learn that and the garden team can can learn that as well you've got more more knowledge between the two things and they'll understand why we want it at that size mm. and that's how it, you know that's how it uh, it works so it's been really beneficial mm. i think we've got more more knowledge in, in in the team of both and they understand each other's pressures and they're all holding the back the chefs going oh they think they're working hard but when they're bending lower than they're bending and they're using muscles that they're not used to using yeah. you see them all moaning and growing and blisters on hands you know where they've been you know using a hoe or you know, yeah. uh, getting those weeds out. You know, so yeah. it's 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 interesting. But unless you bring them both together, um, but to understand the connection of the soil, the plant, to the cooking and the final product, I think is really essential. Mm. We know that did, knowledge. Did, did you always have that kind of uh, I don't know appreciation, I suppose, of, of of produce and and freshness, or is this something that's very much been honed here? Well, you know, going back to when I was a kid. Um, We'd go and stay over on a, a Saturday with my, my grandparents. My granddad grew the vegetables. My nan used to cook them. We were shelling the peas and the broad beans and everything else. And to see my granddad and uncle um, in the garden, my dad wasn't that into it, but my uncle and my grandfather were. And, the, you know, they grew just about everything, right. you know, which is great. So that was that was lovely. And again, you have your own little go in a tiny little plot in very clay soil on the Wirral in Merseyside, you know, trying to grow stuff was, was, was tough. But to see this and just have the, your own, you know, the chance to make your own garden is fantastic. Very therapeutic stuff. Yeah. Um, good for well-being and all the rest of it. I think, it's, you know, you must know yourself that you've, you've done it and it's back-breaking hard work. But when you grow something and nurture something yourself, mm. the enjoyment you get from that is immense. Yeah, I think, you know, even if it's not just a, a kitchen garden, I just think that link to the seasons and getting outside, what do they call it now? green bathing or something I think isn't it which okay. is fundamentally just get out in the forest you know it's like yeah. doctors are prescribing drugs for you know depression or, or, or mental yeah. health issues and stuff but the, the best thing I think you can do there's something hardwired yeah. into our DNA which is get out get the soil between your fingers yeah. feel the seasons you know the different the, the, the fresh air I don't know it's yeah. so good for you yeah. getting in amongst nature and I think that's you know that's all the therapy we really need yeah I think do you so. know what I mean yeah so, so, so balance it. yeah so access to this I I incredible produce, then your style of cooking, presumably, if the if the raw ingredients are that incredible, you're not doing a crazy amount to them in the kitchen, is that right? What yeah. what is your kind of style of cooking here? Well, try and keep it be as true to the ingredient as you possibly can, and if it is, a, if it's a shard or it's a tomato or whatever, maybe feature that. That's the first thing you taste, and the other bits, the other textures you add to it should complement it and everything else. But you really want to see what it is. It's not. Um, you know, it's not disguised in any way. It is what it looks like. There's no secrets to it. It's grow the best varietal and treat it with respect. Yeah, I'm, I'm laughing because I have to chuck my spinach that I grow in the garden in a smoothie because it doesn't have that aesthetic that yours probably has because 90% of it's been eaten by the slugs, but we've yeah. worked out how to resolve that now. Um, Just don't put your slug in the smoothie. That yeah. wouldn't be, wouldn't <laughs> I don't be know, good. A bit, bit, bit of protein. Um, so... You're renowned here for sustainability, for your ethics around food. You, you know, amazing that you've got that organic accreditation uh, in your own garden, so you can control it. How much of the, uh, you know, do you use all of the produce here, and do you have to still bring a lot in? And how do you make sure, I suppose, that your suppliers hit the same standards that you do? Because you know, it must you, you set a very high bar, I suppose, yeah. don't you? Again, selecting selecting your suppliers is, is really important. Um, we've had one over, over this um, period, COVID period, um, one of the suppliers is, is not, no longer trading. So I've chosen three or four um, companies that I think um, uh, deserve a shout. And we've, we've asked them to send us a little box of seasonal produce every um, once a week, so every Tuesday, um, just so we can see their consistency and level of thing and what they want to show us, what's at the market. You know, Not high value things, but things that might be unusual or things that they're interested in that we might be interested in as well. Just to see, because you can get a website of somebody that can be, you can have a great web, web person to design your website, but the product can be something something completely different. So we're going on flavor and taste and what you get in your hands, you know, what they can send you and what's gonna make a difference. So again, we in our selection, we've done that over three or four weeks and we've, we've found somebody that will, will more than replace our suppliers better than the previous supplier and we're going to have something very, very uh, superb. But again, if you look at where they're getting the product from, it's an individual farm. They know the farmer well. They've been, they've visited that farm, and you know you've got something special. 
in, yeah. in, that's coming to you. So you're ordering what you can. We can't possibly grow everything here, but then we've got to search out the very best ingredients. Uh, and and organic were absolutely possible, you know, so that's what we're searching for. Right. And again, you all work with them thinking about seasonality, I suppose, and, and how you yeah. control your menus, because presumably they can't just send you a box of whatever they've got on a Tuesday and you write your menu that way, but it, but it's pretty close, I guess. Is it within a week or two in advance they can tell you what's coming through? Well, you know that generally, because you've been in the, in the trade for a little while. You know, we know the seasons pretty well, but then they can throw you something that you, you, know, you mightn't seen before. You know, we got the huge chestnuts uh, just the other day, which is just like massive, massive chestnut. And again, it's something that we want to develop. It's only right at the beginning of the season, yeah. um, just starting now. So, you know, it's something that we want to turn into, a, you know, make a dish of. Yeah. Um, so you'll get something uh, that's exceptional and you think, OK, we've got to feature that, we've got to make it, you know. Um, so that's that's the next play time to... Yeah. And how do you do it with fish? Because I know when I've had the, the dream scenario f- yeah. for us, but it's very difficult, you know, different end of the market I suppose you know very high number of covers on the beachfront but but the dream scenario with fish is that you know fish boats don't necessarily know what they're going to catch in the day and we loved it if the, if the fish manager would just rock up with a box yeah. of fish that he caught that day and bring it into the kitchen and chefs would turn it into something so love the concept the reality of, of how you actually do that and have it on your menu was really difficult how, how do you supply or how do you uh, yeah get hold of, of good, good quality fish and consistency yeah. Well, we've got a guy who's who's right on the coast, you know, who's, who's moved to the coast, and uh, we've been using I've been u- using this uh, gentleman for twenty years. You can't just have one fish supplier. Also, you've got to, have, um, you know, um, you know, a couple of fish suppliers, which which is important. Um, going from different coasts as well depends if the weather kicks in, you know. Um, but again, if it's a scallop, we want it from we want it hand dive. We want it from Orkney. We we, we know the you know the boat, the guy. Um, which is fabulous. And then when you put a scallop on the menu, you know you've got a scallop because it's just fabulous in the purest water that's going to come from. Equally, um, Langustine from Isle Bambecula, just off Bambecula in the, in the Highlands there. So we, we're taking that from a specific company, um, you know, Creel Court Langustine. So if you're using Langustine, it's the very best. They come in and they're so lively, it's, it's incredible. So the product you get in has to be superb. And equally with the, the fish, it's all day boat stuff. Um, and it arrives, you know, here um, super early. So it's. Do you, you know, know what you're getting, or is it a case that they'll, we, they'll bring you no, one? No, no, we plan for, for the season and, and right. uh, you know, what, what, what we're going to take basically. And we've got to leave, we're, we're quite limited because um, we must only take what's sustainable to take. So it shortens the species. And, um, you know, guests coming here don't want pilchards either. So it's, you've got to be choosing you know um very good quality fish but again it's it's day boat fish as well so it's kind of uh, low impact right um as much as possible you know so that's yeah. that's what we're aiming for so we've got the freshest product we possibly can um and it's it's products that are sustainable right because fish yeah. is so complicated i think isn't it particularly you know in the news a lot at the moment with brexit i guess and, and the regulations and, and british wanting to get their fisheries back but the, you know the, the, when you get into the details around bycatch and you know you can only catch certain things if you catch other species accidentally you're supposed to throw them back in the ocean the fact that fish move the fact that at certain times of the year they yeah. might be in season and have eggs the size of the fish it's a complicated old process isn't it how much of that now is is supplier led where they just know what your criteria is or, or do you find that you have to be permanently reminding them of your expectations no, i've got a you know there's the, there's the guy knows <laughs> our, our criteria um as mitch will tell you i'm quite specific on 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 fish and um yeah he, kn- he knows the the you know the um our, our specs basically right. for for what we're looking for okay and he'll get it we, we get the the prime of the market really basically yeah. we're blessed with that which is great but also in terms of the wider issue of uh, fish in the uk we've got to be eating more fish you know you t- you touched on obesity before when we when we met and the, and the current status and if you look at um those things we're, we're catching this fish and it's all going abroad because there's no market for it people won't pay for it and that's that's the thing so we've got to be able to um pay for it and the bycatch is, again is, is obscene you know if you go to marseille that is turned into a fun delicious soup that you know that's because that's how that dish was born what, what they couldn't sell what was left on the boat what are we going to do we're going to make a stew out of it you know Booyah Bay is one of the most fabulous things known to man. Um, was born from that, what was left, what can we do with what's left? And that's a great thing as well. So, you know, we do, we do have to change our attitude to fish. Mm-hmm. The price will pay for fish. And um, what we do with it, you know, it's it's uh, 
yeah, it needs rebalancing because we're eating a lot of processed nonsense when we could be eating super fresh fish. It's odd, isn't it? We're an island nation. You know, we're surrounded by the ocean. Yep. We must have, you know, had had eaten shed loads of fish in our history. I yeah. don't know what changed, and and yeah, how do we end up now eating so much of a processed diet? It's odd, yeah. isn't it? Do you know the the reasons, and how do we fix it? I suppose I can't tell you, but we've got to, People have to give it a try. I hear a lot of people say, "I'm not, I'm not keen on fish." <laughs> well, you know, um, you got to give that a try. You got to, you know, you got to. Uh, we just got to, you know, take like the mackerel, for example. What a mackerel will do, not only is it the, the flavour a fresh mackerel. I'm not talking one that's two days old because that's something else, but a freshly caught mackerel is just absolutely stunning. There's nothing to beat it. But what that will do for your body and your brain and everything else and your energy levels and you know it's got everything your body needs, as well in terms of those oils and things. So it's just taking something like that. But at the moment we catch it and we flog it over <laughs> overseas. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's another thing with uh, you know we we've got to be a little bit more what we catch what we grow do we grow enough at 50 percent we only grow 50 percent at this moment in time so we're reliant on outside when there could be more in our fields mm. i suspect yeah you know we need to uh mobilize that a little bit i would say we do yeah no god it's got to be fixed and, and hopefully the sort of the, the focus at the moment on on health and childhood obesity the, you know and all this kind of stuff fundamentally it's about you know, real food and processed food, I think, isn't it? Most of us can understand that the more food is, is, is processed, and this all comes from big food manufacturers being able to put a pretty cardboard box around it and, and paint it or whatever and then sell it for a yep. huge premium, whereas you can't, you know, no, you, you don't go into the supermarket and see the amazing virtues of broccoli because it, it, it just yeah. comes as a bit of broccoli, isn't it? And nobody shouts about it. So hopefully there'll be a change. The huge growth in the last couple of years, it would seem, about plant-based diets, you know, the recognition of that. Um, what's your thoughts? Because because food trends historically, I suppose, in kitchens have, have driven chefs bonkers, particularly some of the sort of fad stuff that comes along occasionally. But yeah. we, we, you know, I think we do have this sort of moral and ethical responsibility to be conscious of the planet. You talk about organic. Where, where do you think this, I don't know, use of, of protein and stuff and, and shift to plant comes into the mix? Yeah. I think it's a really good subject. I think, you know, if you look at the, the shape of the nation, shall we say, in terms of obesity, we definitely need to be eating less protein. Um, we need to be eating more, more fish protein rather than uh, selling it and be prepared to pay for it. Um, that's the other thing. Um, but I think in terms of balance and health, I think in my own diet, I've started to you know eat more plant-based things. I haven't cut out fish, I haven't cut out meat, I haven't cut out any of those things, but I'm eat, you know using less. And in our cooking, also um, in our processes, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a puree, for example, um, do we need all of that butter and all of that cream? Could we use you know the coconut? Could we use the coconut milk? Could we use the almond milk? Those things. So that's what we're playing with at the moment. So you do in one process, which is good for your your regular guest, your vegan guest, and your vegetarian guest. And they come to us. They search us out and come to us because we look after them when they get here. You know, and um, it's not always the case in restaurants. Um, but we've got vegan uh, guests coming to us quite quite regularly, and we need to evolve the menu around that as well. So we we're not changing huge amounts. We're reducing the proteins and increasing the the plant based um, areas as well, which is you know I think where our diets need to be anyway, which, which yeah. is good. I think we need to understand that, chefs. You you look uh, you know trim and fit and healthy. I suppose there was a tradition, wasn't it? Was it ne never trust a thin chef at one point, wasn't it? Is that yeah. we and, and particularly French cooking was classically lots of butter, lots of cream. Yeah. Um, I suppose with 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 Raymond in particular having that sort of classic French background, is is he on board and sort of recognises that? Yeah, why why use extra fat and extra sugar if we Absolutely, don't need yeah. to? But also, you know, um, way back when. Um, when I come from the Rue Brothers, uh, originally I trained with the, at the waterside with uh, Michel. Um, heavy on on cream and butter, and then you've you've got you know you could see an immense difference in the, the level of so it's always been there with the, with the memoir and Raymond's philosophy as well, and we're just taking that a little step further by reducing them a tiny bit more and adding other ingredients that are flavoursome and has got texture that you don't you know you don't miss, mm. um, and that's the thing, not to miss it. It can't feel like a, a compromise. A compromise and it's got to be really flavoursome great textures um, and if you can do that well and it tastes delicious but it's also doing your body good as well Amazing. that's amazing it's how you feel yeah. after that meal after that tasting menu 
Do you feel stodgy and, and heavy? Um, you know, do you, do you wake up feeling, oh my God, what just happened? Yeah. Or do you feel like on your feet and ready for breakfast? Yeah. That, that's the thing and that you've got to balance. And I think that's... And I think particularly with the, with the backdrop behind us of, of the gardens, you know, I changed my diet a couple of years ago, put predominantly plant-based and you know, everybody always thinks it's what you've taken away from you. How do you give up that? How do you give up that? And I was like, you know what? I, it's what I've added to my diet, which has made the difference, not what yeah. I've taken away. Yeah. Because you must have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different species out there of herbs and plants yeah. and veggies and stuff. Whereas there's four or five kind of key meats we use on a regular basis, yeah. albeit they can be cooked in different ways. There is a, just a, such a huge number. I started adding, you know, much more lentils and chickpeas and nuts and, and just yeah, the variety of vegetables. And, and all of a sudden I was yeah. like, wow. And, and actually I'd been missing out. It, it sort of got me excited again about cooking yeah. because I was adding so much yeah. interesting stuff to my diet so yeah. i think it's nice if it like you say it's not a compromise and it can sit there and, and hold its own on the menu and it's not labeled as a as a vegan product it's just yeah. a really good dish it's a good product and a good thing and you're expanding your repertoire on those things as well and your knowledge um, which is great so we focus on those things and just okay get a vegetable that's just coming into season and then okay we'll, we'll get a couple of the gardens okay we want to work on this you try this you try this and all of a sudden everyone's working in a corner on that particular vegetable how to get the best out of it and how to so it's recognizable as well as that product it's not disguised as something else and lots of smoke and whistles and bells it's it looks like what it is yeah. but it tastes phenomenally good and that's what we work on we work on the best product and getting the best flavor out of that as, as simply as we can mm. basically I'm, I'm laughing again because i'm trying to work out how we got here and, and my mum will probably listen to this and be terribly offended but <laughs> I think I blame my mum's because vegetables were, you know, they were overcooked, they were mushy, they were just, you know, certainly in, in, in my childhood, but I think too much of British history was, yeah, you know, boil a cabbage for an hour and, and serve yeah. that, and it felt like, I don't know, it was just that unpleasant bit on the side of the plate, whereas now, you know, veggies can be the star, yeah. but maybe we've just got better at, at growing produce, and I suppose probably the supply chains, the fact that you can now get rainbow chard delivered yeah. or, or, you know, to your door from your local supermarket in, in perfect condition, yeah. I suppose you just couldn't do that 20 years ago. I think knowledge has, has, has gained as well, and also, um, you know, the fact that, you know, in the 60s, the Rue Brothers came, and then in the 70s and 80s, you had these great restaurants coming up, and the guys, the, the top chefs now in England are fantastic, the knowledge level is, is huge which is great um so there's a lot more you know look at the cookbooks are available now on on this on the subject there's huge amounts of of knowledge out there which is fantastic which is great and mm. you know if we can gain a little bit more of that and uh, get everyone to the right shape it would be good it'd be helpful wouldn't it yeah, yeah. Symp sympathize with the government with all they've got on their plate Indeed. excuse the pun but very much hope that uh yeah health and nutrition becomes part yeah. of the part of the conversation but i think it also starts in schools and and, and getting kids involved you mm. know um, which i've done with my family but also the royal academy of culinary arts do something called chefs adopt a school yeah and i was very pleased to get on board with this because i think it's really important that the kids so you know i went to my local um primary school which was fabulous in Chalgrove. I bet and, they couldn't uh, believe it when you rocked up, could they? Not, not everybody no, gets you to adopt a school. <laughs> first of all, we're in, we're in a, an area, you know, I grew up in, in Merseyside, but we're in an area that is, um, you know, quite a wealthy area. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to do some good, so I looked up, um, okay, who's in special needs, which, or, um, you know, which school is not doing so well in the county? And there was one it wasn't doing too well, and it was in my own village, so I couldn't ignore that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't want to go to the posh school no, where... Good. The parental guidance might be might be Wouldn't great. Be I wanted to go somewhere where um, um, where it could make a difference, and that was on the agenda. And when I went and introduced myself, um, fantastic lady said absolutely. So we put in raised beds. We got our we got our organic poo from our supplier. We put it in. We built the beds. We grew vegetables with the kids, um, and I went along and cooked different things. And if then everybody has the ability to make a pan of soup. Do you know what I mean? The nutritional value in that is just immense and you can put anything in. You can open your fridge and there's half an onion, there's two carrots, there's a leek, there's a bit of this and a bit of that and some herbs, whatever it may be, you can make a fantastic soup from that. So I was teaching them how to make soups and risottos and different different things. You know, we made pizza with them as well, which is great. And we went back, you know, a couple of times, um, which is great. And from that, I got one guy interested in it. He then went on to secondary school, came along on a Saturday, he then um, went on to college, then started as our apprentice. So this is like a nine-year journey for this yeah. guy. And this particular chap won Apprentice of the Year last year, which is fabulous, wow. Thomas, Thomas Marriage. 
local lad from Childrove. And again, if you can do that in the community, in the community you're in, it's really quite nice as well. So it was good to go to the school and see these kids, but the enthusiasm this one had. So it was worth that just to be able to take this young lad and find what he wanted to do. Because again, you wanted to be a chef, boom, and this spurred him on. Yeah. And now he's in there. Have you had breakfast at the Manoir today? This young chap cooked it. Really? That's awesome. Uh, which is fabulous. Yeah, yeah. From brilliant. a primary school situation yeah, to... Yeah. Just that little being spark a yeah, triggered that Mama, yeah. imagination. So again, chefs are doing this all over the country and that's what's really important. So if we can do that and get the kids growing food, cooking food, touching food, tasting those vegetables, um, which is great. And the first thing, what we would do when we did these um, cooking sessions with the kids, um, we'd put vegetables almost like crudités on the table but set them in vases like they were a flower arrangement and a we put them on the table and said the first thing I would sell to them is nobody eat the flower arrangements okay and you turn your back and all of a sudden everyone is just guzzling on carrots and peppers Brilliant. and you know which is great yeah. so the kids really enjoy that so it's good, it's good you make it fun and you get them all involved but that's where it starts in schools and the fact that we took cooking away from schools is tragic we need to get people every single person needs how to f needs to know how to feed themselves and if they can do that we'll be on to um a better future already in terms of that obesity everyone's opening packets to eat when you can just you know cook from you know peeling a vegetable and and you know lentils and nuts yeah you know fish you know simple simple things doesn't have to be expensive just cooking a, an egg well yeah. you know you it's, can feed yourself yeah. making soup all of those things and i think if the kids can we can get back to that in our schools. We'll see a lot less hustle in our hospitals later on. Do you know mm. what I mean? Which I is, agree, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's yeah. whole foods at the end of the day. My wife's a primary school teacher. She's, okay, she's just gone back full time, and uh, yeah, yeah, funny enough, we've been chatting about exactly that, getting the little sort of garden area outside yeah. her classroom and, and growing a few bits. But yeah. uh, so important, I think a lot of us recognise it. It's just how do we how do we yeah, make it happen on a national level? But we could probably spend two hours talking about that, Gary. So Absolutely. we'll do a we'll do a special on it. Um, so your history is, is is phenomenal like i say we'll, we'll touch on some of the chefs that have come through and, and how you do that but you, you you followed a fairly traditional approach into hospitality and the fact that you went to the catering school for a couple of years yeah when did you know did, did you know i suppose before you went to catering school that you Absolutely. wanted to be a chef yeah, yeah? What, what was the trigger when did you know trigger was my mom was a good cook and um, i saw the reaction when she put good food on the table how everyone went wow this is fantastic it would change everyone's mood um, in a good way. Um, and it was just good to see the, those reactions. What you could do with food can make everybody, you know, you know, enjoy it. And when people got around a table and you put good food down, you know, it's a fantastic thing. Mm. So you would see from this age this thing happening and thinking, wow, this is great. But the enjoyment you got from, the, from good food, which is great. And that was you think, okay, let's look at this. Let's, uh, you know. So I remember um, in primary school, um, the inaugural flight of Concorde, everyone's writing about where the wings came from and where the engine was from and, you know, the collaboration between England and France, which was all interesting. I was more interested in what the menu was really? on the plate, wow. you know what I mean, which is, which is a funny thing. But I knew when I was 10 years old what I wanted to do. That's so, amazing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It is, but, uh, you know, I've said to my kids, find something that you want to do, something you're going to enjoy because it's, it's important stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so then, yeah, from an early age, my mum was a good cook, my nan was a good cook, and stop saying your mum was a good cook because you're making me look bad for that comment okay. I made earlier when my mum listens, Gary. Forgive him, mum. Forgive him, <laughs> mum. You get you're a brilliant mum. There's nothing better than a pre-made shepherd's pie. No, I'm making it worse. Um, so, was there someone with with that kind of passion and focus, which is amazing, and that carries on through your career? Uh, were you any good? Was it was it obvious? Did, did somebody sort of at college go, you know what, Gary, you're actually a really bloody good chef? Was it obvious, or did you have to? Uh, just work hard. You got to work. You work hard at it, you know. And I think that's another thing. Hard work is uh, important. And uh, yeah, I loved it. I think I had a flair for it. Um, yeah, and wherever I went, I got <laughs> promoted quickly. And it was just, you know what I mean. See, so you know, you had to change the divisions really um, when you was a younger chef. Yeah. You could get into a place and you'd suddenly go from there to there, and you get into another place and go from there to there fast. And then you think, hang on what's the highest division you can go to? And you, you think, okay, the Michelin world, okay, what's the top of that, the three, boom, and then you aim to get yourself a job in one of those places. Hard work. Yeah. But 
um, I loved every second. And you, you were always so, seemed to have that clarity and that, and that drive and that focus. Do, do you know where that came from? Was that just bit, it built into you? Was it from a, just from decide what you want to do and work at it. You know, I think that's, <laughs> that's an important thing, you know, make a decision on what you want to achieve, what you want to do, and uh, working hard at it and not changing course, I think, is, is, is important. Yeah. Okay. So specifically, Le Manoir, you, you've, you've been here twice, initially back yeah. in 1990. You then disappeared for a period of time and, and came back. Am I right in saying that, that you originally turned down the job of sous chef because you, you hadn't worked on all the sections yet yeah. and you wanted to work across the kitchen? Because that's, yeah. it's, again, it's pretty rare, I suppose, not to just take the promotional opportunity and a, and a bit of a pay rise, but that, that reflects again that, that sort of. I don't know, just, just laser focus that you had, I suppose, on, yeah. on where you wanted to be. Can you just explain a little bit about yeah, well, that yeah. decision-making, I suppose? Absolutely, yeah. I think, um, yeah, when I arrived, um, you know, Clive was, Clive Fretwell, fantastic uh, Yorkshireman, um, lovely chap, grafter. Um, and again, you had some fabulous chefs in, in, in the kitchen as well. Michael Keynes, Aaron Patterson, you know, Richard Neat had just left. You've got Eric Chaveau, all of these fabulous chefs in there. And... Um, you know, when you're offered a position of sous chef, you know, and you hadn't done that section or this section or the other section, how could I take on that role without knowing fully? So I'd get myself on a section and work through the entire repertoire of the of that section and made sure I'd cooked everything, done it, tasted it, um, and understood it, and then moved on to the next section and did the same till I'd com- cooked all of the repertoire. Um, and if that took me getting in earliest and going home latest, that was what I'd done. So as soon as I'd covered all of the sections then, I, I you know, um, I guess you felt you were worthy of that position, yeah. And how long yeah. did that take? Just over a year, yeah. yeah. So you were up, they obviously thought you could do the job, but you yeah. said, no, you know what, I'm going to do it. Were they surprised at the time? Was that Clive that had offered it to you? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then, you know, um, I got it, you know, the, yeah, when, when I... Th- Knew I was ready for it. Yeah, I just, I, I just love the fact that you that. were that, you were yeah, that yeah, focused, yeah. which which but leads on to you know yeah, all the stuff uh, you achieve later, I yeah. suppose. But I think you've got to you know you there's no point in telling other people what to do on that section if you've not done that section yourself. Mm. You know that's really important to to learn those different things and and from that experience as well, it's how we set our training and you know we we do turn out some fabulous uh, young chefs. That's from an here. understatement. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and it, it's it's learning a section well, yeah. but not only learning it well, um, it's being able to pass that knowledge on to the next guy that under you. So we'll, we'll put a guy on a section who, who, the first two, three weeks, it's really tough and it'll take him longer to do because you're reading through the recipe and trying to understand it. But there's somebody alongside guiding you. Um, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, once you've done those with guidance you'll start to the person guiding you will back off slightly and and, and, and watch you do those things um, and then you know a month in on that section you've kind of got it and you know it and you nailed it and it's not the same with everybody everybody's different so you've got to look at that some people take longer some people are quicker it depends on their experiences um, and then eventually they've got it nailed boom and you put then a younger guy next to them and what's the, the important thing is you know what they've understood by when you're listening to them train and coach the next person underneath them. Yeah. And that's a good thing. And the guys that are good at the training and the coaching to the guy alongside, the weaker guy that needs to be strengthened, mm. that's when you see the knowledge of that guy. And, that guy. and I and think you learn p- through so much, don't you, yeah. through teaching? Yeah, and the potential of that person then to become go on to be a chef de party and a sous chef and eventually a head chef of their own. You know, So we work on those. We work on... Um, achieving a certain level on a, on a section and then moving to the next thing, nailing that, moving on to the next thing. So you're building layers of experience, str- solid, strong foundations mm. in learning. I think that's really key to, to making sure that the, the go out solid citizens. And as you mentioned, um, we've got one or two of those who've it, uh, Did I read 18 doors. Michelin star chefs? I'd come from more here? than that. We're 30, odd, we're 30, thir- 30 odd. Yeah. Really? 30 odd. In the, low, just... in the early thirties of, of uh, maybe it was 18 since you've been here. Say again. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't since you've been here, or yeah, was it thirty could, could, in your? Could be, could yeah. could well be. I don't know, but, but that's um, just. I mean, there can't be anywhere else in, in the world that's turned out more Michelin star chef, surely. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So All I can tell you is about here, and there's a thirty odd um, just, young men that have come along, worked with us, and, and gone on to earn Michelin stars of their own, which was which is fabulous. It's just really good. So those guys that are interested in that need to, you know, 
eventually pass through the doors. You know, I think that's it. That's important. Mm -hmm. And I think to do that and to turn the kitchen round, you need about two to three years of, of, of being here. You know, yeah. you can't do it in a year. It's Your training course is two and a half years, I think, isn't it? What, what, do you, what level do you take them at and to in that time period? Well, I think, you know, um, there's no set time because you can't, it's, it's hard to get um, the generation to commit to two or, two or three years. You've got to make sure that you're nurturing them and looking after them so they stay two or three years, even five years, some of them, you know, and beyond. Um, so, yeah, that is a training programme of, you know, but it does take about two and a half years to get round all of the sections and well and do it well and then you end up being a chef tournant which is like you could then go and help the younger guys with less experience on those supportive role which is also good to see those guys that are supportive mm. um and their approach with the with the other guys in the kitchen which is good which is more important now than ever before in the rest of the industry for the last few years there's been a real sort of shortage of chefs i suppose and it's been quite hard to recruit into the sector i'd like to think with the credentials that you guys have got that there's sort of 100 people turning up every morning you know queuing, queuing out the door to get into the kitchen how's, how's it been do you have a big waiting list of people who want to come and join you we've we've, we've got the you know sufficient amount of chefs at this minute in time you know <laughs> could could we do with some more you know nobody's going to say no um so yeah industry wise it's 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 been hard to get people yeah. into the industry ac across the board you know and talking to colleagues um they're finding the same the same thing um but you know it it's the you know kitchens have been tough historically and you see certain things on television you think oh my gosh is that what they work in but you know we're the opposite of that you know yeah. we we try and have a, a calmer cooler more uh, patient approach with with learning as should we say so um you yeah. seem very calm and, and zen. Admittedly, we are sat in a, in a garden, which must help. Yeah. Have you always been that way in the kitchen, or did you go nope. through that angry stage? <laughs> no, there's going to be a few I chefs did. listening to us yeah. laughing, going, "No, he wasn't." <laughs> no, he, he definitely wasn't. And um, you know, lots of things have helped me over the years. Obviously, uh, becoming a parent, which, which was one. Um, I did some martial arts, which was, which was good yeah. for me as well. And yeah, because there was, you know, when I grew up in the uh, in the in the eighties in kitchens, it was it was you a know different, a completely different, different a completely different culture. So you've got to learn from that and what not to do and take it from there because we've all made mistakes. And I think it's important that uh, you learn from those things. Yeah, so I've done a little bit of um, martial arts and I do yoga and stuff to, you know, yeah. complete that yen, uh, Zen thing, if you, if you will. But again, you can't go around screaming and shouting. And if I raise my voice, the guys know. They've been <laughs> you would have been told three or four times previously uh, how it should be done or how it should be. I'm, I've also shown them a couple of times as well before I'd raise my voice but it's very rare these days it's very rare okay <laughs> that's good what was the motivation to get into martial arts by the way how, how long ago was that um I did it for a six year period and it was about four or five years ago um wow. I, I got a black belt yeah did you? which was which of crying. course you did did, course you, did you decided that before you started probably didn't you I did yeah that was, that was the target that was the, that was the aim um the motivation was um I've got three daughters and I wanted them to put on a backpack and go anywhere in the world and feel confident so they started at an early age so they're all on the dojo early and I took them along first of all I, I had no I didn't intend to do it um, but once I decided something then I'll go for it you know so um, I watched my daughters for two weeks on this dojo with a fantastic man uh, Roland Reed who, who runs a uh, Ryan Bukai Karate Club at uh, Wheatley and Holton Sports Centre or used to before the Covid um, kicked in um, fabulous man and he, he used to take all of these youngsters and, and turn them into disciplined uh, young things that could you know if trouble occurred then they could um, find a way out of that as, as swiftly as possible um, so I just wanted my daughters to have some of those things um, so I went on went along and watched for a couple of weeks and I thought I was just sitting there and I'm not a sitter I like to be active so I thought well if they're doing it we may as well enjoy the journey with them and there's one other chap sat on the he had three sons I've got three daughters we sat there for two weeks and thought nah let's give it a go next week and we did we egged each other on and we we took that journey you know white belt yellow belt uh, you know all the way up to up to the black and the gradings and everything else it took six, six years of Sundays three or four sessions on a Sunday wow. um, and one in midweek Really? You know, to, to to get that, which was good. But what I loved about it, and the can you know, the you reach a certain like the kitchen. There's the commie level. There's the demi chef. There's the chef de party. There's a senior chef de party. There's the junior sous chef. The sous, chef, and that's what the belts were like for me. So you go into the room knowing nothing, and then you learn the basics. You step up one. 
you learn a bit more and then you those constant steps of guidance and obviously perfecting what you're doing basically and then you turn out boom you achieve something which is good so i love that part of it yeah, the structure great. and the clarity yeah. did the kids yeah. Go up in the same way with you? The kids got to, um, my eldest got to Brown Belt with a, a, a tag, which was good. It got re- That's when it gets tough. And, uh, you know, she, she didn't want to continue because she got to a certain age as well. She was like 16 when she thought, you know, do I need this? Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and boys became more important. But she's going to be all right if she's backpacking through Thailand. She oh, can, she'll be she fine. She can handle herself. She'll be fine. That she'll must be, be fine. nice. You can relax. Yeah, and the middle one, uh, Charlie, who's, who's a chef also here, she's on the... Uh, Got me chef in the oh, kitchen wow. as well. Um, well, she has been for the last three or four years. Um, she got to her green belt. Okay. Do you know what I mean? She's good. So do they look at you and go, Dad, you have to take it too far. Why did you have to go and get a black belt? You just <laughs> they're, they're used to it. There's not going to stop. There's nothing going to stop me getting that. But it was good. It was a really good um, journey. Have you know? Yeah, I think the good thing with martial arts so good for your head as well, isn't it? It's yeah, not just exactly, body. Yeah. It's just really good. But mind. in terms of you know, you mentioned um, angry chefs. Mm. You know what I mean? You you know you put yourself up against some of these guys and you, you, you don't need to be angry you just need to be um, you know disciplined mm. with yourself and everyone around you know to I mean treat everybody with respect and I think that's uh, where we go in the kitchen as well so you can bring some elements of that to the kitchen as well and again it's quite a physical thing and um, you know but it was really really good but these days I'm doing a bit more yoga I'm doing hot so yoga so do, do you not do the karate anymore? I do for myself. I do my right. own catches in my uh, a little conversion I've done in my, okay. my garage, basically. I've got my kick bag and everything else. So I do that for myself, but I don't go to class anymore. Yeah. Um, okay. But you got to. But I didn't want to go, you know, I will do more when, when time allows. Yeah. When time allows, but I've put it to one side. I'm focusing on yoga, yoga. now. You're going to be a yoga instructor? Or how, how do you take yoga? I don't know. Can you get a black belt in yoga? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> Do you have to grow long hair? I'm just trying to think how they accredit how they accredit you with knowing. No, I don't think. It, I don't think, do. I think that's just years of practice. I think it's years of practice. But again, to stay flexible, I'm working with a, a bunch of 20 year olds. I'm 55 years old. Yeah. Um, I'm working with a group of 20 to 30 year olds uh, maximum. So uh, I've got to be the fastest in the room. So yeah, amazing. I was looking. Do you know yoga with Adrian? Have you ever seen that online YouTube? No, with, I was no. looking yesterday. She's yeah. a, she's an American yoga teacher. Because funny oh. enough, I'm looking at yoga myself at the moment. And, uh, Get it anyway, done. Yeah, I need to need to do it. I think yeah. again, headspace, flexibility. It's yeah. just as you as you get older, keeping fit, I suppose. Yeah. Isn't it? But martial arts is another one my son does, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's great, great to see. My girls go crazy because I'll walk around the corner. I'm doing a headstand in the garden at one o'clock in the morning, you know, just to, with uh, your torch on, looking for slugs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. In between, <laughs> in between. <laughs> uh, yeah, too too driven. Um, I've got to ask, how do you end up on Necker Island? Oh, that was fabulous. That was um, a great little. Um, journey um yes there was this young we were again way back when my first stint at the memoir I did three and a half years um as the sous chef well i started as a chef de party and worked all the sections became sous chef and then th- there's a young lady um with us on a on a stage the new she was a young glaswegian uh, lady uh, a wee wendy and um she was very nervous and anxious and i said look this is i'm going to be here alongside what a I was on the I was running the fish that weekend. We had a really hectic weekend. I think it was a bank holiday weekend, and she came into the kitchen, you know, and I said, "Okay, you're working with me," and I could see she was nervous. And okay, so okay, so I took her through every single step of what she needed to do in the service, what the you know, what the garnish was. I was cooking the fish. She was warming the garnish for me, and we put it together on the pass, and. Um, she started the weekend off feeling super, super anxious and nervous. And by the end of the weekend, she was full of confidence and just absolutely loved the experience with no experience of, of, of the kitchen before. So that was fabulous. So, you know, we just took this young lady. And then the, the next week she says, I need you to come and meet somebody. Um, so we, we had a break and I said, she said, come and have a coffee. Okay, I came and have a coffee. So we went to Kidlington. I sat down at this very posh house sat down coffee and then Richard Branson walks down from stairs he said I hear you're the guy the guy that's good at training people you know I'm thinking <laughs> how surreal is that he said I want you to come and walk my, around my pond with me and he said we've got I've got this little island you had this huge lake you <laughs> know um and it was lovely to a to meet the guy because he was you know legendary um but then to also walk around his property. And then he said to me, I've got this um, little place in the Caribbean. Um, 
as a videotape at the time. Uh, you know, the old style yeah. videotape. Have a look at that, and that will tell you where, where I'm talking about, because this will explain more. Um, but we'd like you to come along and train the team over there to cook great food for our guests, who were superstars at the time. It was a recording studio. It was built as a recording studio. Um, not much recording went on, but uh, <laughs> lots of parties did. So it was, it was a great opportunity where I'd, I'd taken this young person and, and made them feel confident about what who, they were who doing. Who was she in relation to Richard? Then? That was his niece. Uh, when they, was she when there for that purpose? Was it wasn't it wasn't just a she was there guy. to learn about uh, food. She was there to learn about food because right. again she's but a, she's she wasn't a keen, there to find she's a, a chef for no, Necker no, no. Island. That was just she's a, a, she's a keen cook, and she she went home and obviously started talking about this guy who showed no her way. or made her feel confident. Shows about what she was doing, you never know. which was great. Yeah, you don't know, and that's that's the thing. And what's lovely is to get letters, you know, years on. You know, when people reach a certain level, we got one yesterday where the guy's a managing director now, and he said he always draws upon the experience he had when he was in the kitchen. Amazing. You know, the manual. And that's great. And he was, you know, um, sending a letter to, um, to Raymond, myself and Benoit to say, wow. thank you for what you've given me. Yeah, which is nice, which when you, when you hear that, yeah. it's lovely. So that's how the NECA journey began. And so it was, it was a great one. Um, the, the video was obviously pretty good, by the way. Presumably, lots of bikini it was a soundtrack. Women, Brian Ferry, slave, <laughs> slave to love, as these helicopter shots oh, over this island, yeah. turquoise blue. Brilliant. And I'd How been, long did uh, it take you to decide that you were going to take that job? About thirty-five <laughs> seconds. But also, <laughs> I had and I had to let. Um, um, I was going to go to Eugenie de Mans in southwest France uh, to work with Michel Guerin. That was already lined up, okay. and then this came. Plan so, B. Yeah, I said, "Do I want to work for the third Frenchman, or do I want to go and do something different?" And I did, and I popped over there for a couple of years, which was fabulous, which was really, amazing. really good. Yeah. Amazing time, um, amazing memories, and when you leave a place with a tear in your eye, and you're thinking, I've "Really enjoyed this," mm. you know, that's a good thing. We've been back and holidayed since, and Have I'm you? quite hooked on the yeah. Caribbean. It's a, it's that's a great awesome, place. It? Nice kitchen on Necker Island. Did you get to, to, to design it, or was it already in place? Well, it was a. It was messy when I got there, um, but Richard said, you know, what, what, what do you need? need? And uh, he made it happen, which is great. So we got the, we got the kitchen we needed. We dropped in a, a, a big walk-in icebox in the hill, and, and where you go from there. Did you, you know, see the sea from the kitchen? Absolutely. I could see the whole horizon. There was nothing on the horizon from the kitchen side of the, the island, which was fabulous. On the other side, you could see, um, you know, um, Tortola from a distance, uh, Virgin Gorda, um, Beautiful place. If you're not been to the British Virgin Islands, you need to go. Yeah, no, super, no, no, super, been to, super to Barbados place. and some of the Caribbean, but, yeah. but never been there. So, uh, okay, yeah, nice, nice little spot. You can see the um, the ocean from my kitchen or my restaurant on the beach, and I always say to the chefs, "You don't know how lucky you are. You can actually yeah. see the sea." They don't necessarily believe me because there's also about 100 customers between them and the ocean. And, yeah. uh, and then well, in Oxfordshire, that's important because you know we can't see the sea here, of course. You, you can't I mean? see the sea. No, yeah. you've, you've got the, uh, the the garden equivalent, I suppose. Absolutely. So. Um, what was the trigger then to, to leave and come back to the UK? Well, I wanted to fi uh, find a place that um, wanted a Michelin star. I, I wanted to get a Michelin star. I think to get recognition for what you do and your work is important. So uh, I set about looking for that. And at the time, there was nowhere. But somebody came to, why I left Necker was somebody came and headhunted me and said, we believe you You can cook on an island, which is it can be quite difficult as well because there's the, the island fever thing. So I ended up opening a, um, a resort for Sonny Shivdasani in the Maldives, which was great. Um, you know, so we, we, you know, as the opening consultant for that, while I was waiting for a position in the UK, somebody want, wanted a, a, a chef to earn them a Michelin star, really. Yeah. So. so so what do you need to make that? You knew you wanted a Michelin star, but you knew to do that, you, you couldn't just go off and do it on your own, presumably. You, you yeah. wanted to find somebody that had a kitchen, a restaurant, yeah. and presumably some, some money, I suppose, because you've yeah. got a, it's, it's going to cost you a few quid to have that level of dedication, is it? What, what were you looking for? Yeah, I just needed to know, and I needed, was I, was I capable, could I earn that, could I earn that accolade, you know, and then, and, and um, you know, become a, a chef, you know, and that's the, that yeah. was the drive for so it. So who did you partner up with then? I partnered up with the Fenton family at the Homewood Park, and, uh, you know, I met a member of the, um, the son, and the, the um, the restaurant manager um, interviewing me, which was good, and the, and then the owner walked in, um, who was a fabulous chap, and he asked me one question: Can you get us a Michelin star? And I said, Yes, I can. You know what I mean? Boom. Was there any doubt in your mind that you could? No. Really? No. 
And then for people who don't understand the complexities of it, what, what do you, you know, how long did it take and, and what sort of things do you need to do to make that a reality? Well, it's about consistency really in the food and reaching a certain level of quality in the ingredients you use and all of those things. So, um, um, yeah, it's just making sure you've got the best possible ingredients. Is why Mitch Tonks is my fishmonger, and uh, that's how we met. Which is, uh, which is, uh, I know you've interviewed Mitch, yeah. fabulous man. Um, so yeah, it's about the ingredients you use and the, and the quality and the flavours and, the, and and what you do with the plate, basically. But, okay. uh, so how long did it take? Eighteen months. We had four rosettes and a Michelin star in eighteen months with two boys from college. Wow. And a washer upper on a Saturday. How many hours a week were you working? Um, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> every hour that God sent um, yeah I was pale skinny but we achieved the goal and that was that was really important because after that um, we won that star then Clifton came knocking on the door and said we want you to come and run the kitchen at Clifton for us or specifically Waldo's um, restaurant again we're in we won a, another Michelin star and four rosettes there which was, which was good yeah. um, so it was um, yeah it's great and that's when Raymond came to dinner yeah I was going to say so how do you said, end up back here yeah and, and, and Raymond said you, you're absolutely ready I want you to come back and run the kitchen so I didn't have to think twice really? like I did in the sous chef role was I ready I had a Michelin star and a couple of different restaurants yeah so that was the qualification but you were still nervous about having the responsibility you know, to come and run the Manoir Kitchen because it's an institution. It's mm. an absolutely huge thing, you know. And when Raymond's asking you that, you're thinking, you know, yeah. go for that. So, do you, so, so 21 years ago, do you remember how it felt then walking back into that kitchen? Yeah, I was nervous. I was nervous, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I was absolutely nervous. And I'm thinking, you know, because the pressure I put on myself is more pressure than you could ever, you know, find, you know, in any job the pressure I put on myself to achieve that would, you know, would be, because you can't just come here and, um, you know, it's, it's got to be evolving as well. So it's, uh, but it's a great place. And I think Raymond is a um, phenomenal character. And again, it's a massive opportunity. So to be given the, the um, responsibility to run it was huge. But yeah, one I grabbed and uh, I've, I've enjoyed yeah you know. so it already had had two, two Michelin stars since 1981 stars. Yeah. is that right yeah. <laughs> I just find that yeah. insane that that must feel like a phenomenal amount of pressure yeah. because it's, it's yours to screw up at that point isn't it it's not like you're starting from scratch and going to get one it's kind of like yeah. you've got one two don't 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 lose it yeah does that has that pressure eased off over time or do you do you guys still feel that on a on no a the, pre- the pressure doesn't ease off the pressure is constantly there yeah. um and it, it's it's important that you keep evolving with that you know it's it, that's the important bit that you keep evolving yeah, it because it is an evolving thing as well isn't yeah. it the, the expectations the criteria customer expectations have exactly changed that. you look back in the 80s you yeah. know what the customer expected then is so different to now the facilities that you've got how do you make sure you know that you're going to have it for another 40 years, I suppose, isn't yeah. it? On a day-to-day basis, well, you know, what is it? What is it that the man was got that, that gives it that level of consistency? I think it's just making sure that you're um, true to the season, the product, and making sure that um, the cooking techniques are very, very good. You know, on a on a consistent basis, um, and evolving the next thing as well. You know, you got it. Like I talked about the the vegetable working that thing until you've got it the best it can possibly be, the best that you're capable of, and then making sure everyone else can do that on a day-to-day basis and constantly checking every last thing, every last recipe. Every recipe we produce is tested by myself or my, my sous chef um, before it goes in the fridge. That's the important bit. So I've got an initial on it. I know who made it. I know who checked it. Wow. Um, and then it goes in the fridge. So if there's a problem with it, we can trace it back and say, okay, um, I've tasted this. It's slightly under-seasoned or it's slightly over-seasoned or it needs more acidity or it needs more texture whatever it is so then it's it's open and transparent that we, we wouldn't cook it that long next time because or we'd add this because or we'd adjust the recipe as well you know um, so constantly adjusting recipes and, and evolving recipes as well and how many chefs are in your brigade and um, we've gone from 42 to 26 with the covid wow, situation really? yeah yeah because you've reduced covers as well we've reduced covers as well so, that, so, so you've got is it just the one restaurant here or you because obviously the hotel so you're doing yeah we've got one restaurant yeah. Right. How many yeah. covers what was um, it and is it? It was eight. Well, it was 100. Right. Then we took it down to 80. Mm-hmm. Um, and now with the COVID situation, we're, we're 50 covers maximum. Right. Yeah. 50, wow. Okay. Yeah. But 50, um, we've, we've looked at the, the spacing um, to keep everybody safe, to keep the team safe and uh, to keep the guests safe, importantly, um, across the board that everybody is safe. But when you're in one of those tables, you can see the distancing is, is, is good. You right. Know? 
so we're getting good feedback on um, from the guests as well the way the, the the tables are situated could we squeeze more in yes but we don't want to go there because it's important to keep everybody safe yeah um, so something that you may do in time depending on what happens with 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 covid presumably yeah exactly yeah but the, the main thing is everybody's safe that comes here that we're trusted well raymond has been trusted for many years on you know a, a great guest experience and i yeah. think um yeah we've got to make sure that continues and we're going to make the, sure the, that prof the professionalism is, is, is exceptional even in just organizing this interview in the fact you know i got sent a, a questionnaire to fill in before i came i was told when i got here that i needed to wear a mask that my temperature would be checked that who exactly. would meet me and yeah. you think okay yeah, yeah. There's that's a reason. important you know people need to know that you know we, even before they get booked they know they can have the, the temperature taken it's not a probe in your face it's a it's a it's a machine that, yeah. We, yeah, yeah. that you walk by. Yeah, it wasn't and a direct examination you, uh, or anything. It was quite it was quite an easy process. I did yeah, just have to look exactly. at it. Exactly, but that's important for confidence for the, for your guests, for confidence for your team to come to work and to to come out. Um, that's important. Yeah. So, with all of that sort of I suppose infrastructure support stuff in the background, what's a typical Gary day look like now? Are you are you on the pass in the kitchen? Are you behind a laptop? Are you out there weeding? What does it look like? A little bit of everything, really. Um, yes, I'll arrive at uh, nine in the morning and meet with my, uh, you know, my admin team, and then they'll tell me what's going on. Like today, <laughs> yeah, gonna, so there's somebody in the greenhouse waiting for you. Yeah, I'll be in the inter <laughs> interview in the greenhouse, um, which is very rare. Um, but normally it would be in. Um, now, our, our working week is slightly different now. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we decided to um, to keep our hours down of the team to make sure nobody's working too many hours. We closed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday lunch. This is something that the team have loved. The accountants don't particularly like that, but the, the, uh, the team love that. And again, it's finding that balance, which is great. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a lunch and dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, the busier days. So I've got some of the team working um, three days off, four days on, which works well. But I'll arrive at nine and just see what the needs are doing, basically. If it might be, um, it might be, you know, interviewing a, a member of, staff or recruitment or you know just rotors your recipes checking recipes all of those things to make sure the team have got the correct data in front of them basically so i've got a kitchen manager who will work very closely with on who's doing all of the typing of recipes and things i'll scribble them down say this is what we need and then we'll, we'll put them together as a recipe that a, a youngster can understand with lots of chef's notes on as well depending on your experience you know make sure this or uh, don't forget that bit or this is the time this is the bit where you check with the senior chef before you proceed so little stages okay. in the recipes to check where they're at so to get all of that information down is uh, is important so that each one of them got a little pack with every menu that we put out so um, they're constantly evolving as well but when you when you re approach that dish the year after you might change it completely but the basis might be the same so there might be a little bit of that and then two o'clock the brigade all arrive two o'clock or one thirty today we'll have a little kitchen meeting let people know um, what our guest feedback is what are the good points what are the things we need to focus on um, and just things that are happening basically just keep everybody informed keep everybody calm and in, in, in the know about what what they're doing and how we're doing it basically mm -hmm. and then we'll go into preparation so I'll be there amongst the guys chopping slicing dicing tasting every last thing there is um, we'll then take a break around four o'clock um, I take a break around five till about six, six thirty. I go home, um, you know, see the wife and uh, the missus and uh, yeah, the kids, and um, eat, check my garden out, see what needs doing, and then come back for the evening service. And we're there till you know, till you know, ten thirty, eleven, sometimes midnight. Okay, wow. So yeah. still, still heavily involved then. Still working weekends. Saturdays, yeah. Sundays are sacred family days, and that's that's the way I, I like. That's why I've always had it. You know, yeah, so, yeah. many so, of my head chefs yeah, the same. Always yeah. Sundays with the family. Yeah, Sunday's important. Yeah, yeah. Nice. that's that's nice how we get. base everything, and uh, you know, we get round the table together. The importance of that table and bringing your family in and seeing uh, where people are at, which yeah. is not, which is nice. Yeah, amazing. Do you and um, do you and Raymond bring something very different to the kitchen or to the training of the chefs? Do you have different skills? Dif different approaches. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know we are you know very different we we share the same philosophy on on the on the, the product um which is good but we're slightly different approaches um it's like a tornado and when obi comes into the kitchen in a, in a good way he's a he's a bundle of, of energy 
um, and he'll come in and let me taste taste. It's all about tasting, tasting, t- which is which is great, and it's that's how it should be. Because as I said, every recipe we do, we're tasting beforehand. Um, so yeah, he's um, quite. You know, he'll change things on a sixpence, which is <laughs> causes chaos. <laughs> try, is what you're <laughs> he does. That is a word. I wouldn't yeah. call it quite chaos, but he did. Yeah, it, it can get interesting, but in in a lovely way as well. Yeah. You know, we are quite blessed. If you look at the garden that he's created here, look at the you know the the, the building of the memoir and what it represents, and then you produce a dish, and then to have him come and taste it and say maybe try it with this or that or just adjust this or it's a fabulous. Do you know what I mean? And for the young guys when they um, and and myself, when you've got a genius like that and you know, a culinary genius on on your side, um, it's great because of the guidance he gives now, which is great. So he's more he's more in a guiding role now of the dishes, which which is fabulous. But he tastes every last thing. He wants yeah. to taste every dish that we create, and um, he helps us evolve them from there. You know, which which is fantastic. Mm. But we are we are slightly different approaches. <laughs> I like to set things in stone. This is the way we're going to do it, and he'll come yeah. along and no, let's go. This, you know what I mean? From the heart. Yeah, exactly. I can imagine, yeah. I can imagine the carnage that causes just before service. <laughs> yeah, but you know that that should never change. He yeah, should never absolutely. change that because he is the DNA. Yeah. He's the actual uh, epicenter of the place, which yeah. is, which is great. It, it, which is why we've got all of this. You know, um, we've grown all of these chefs over the years. Yeah. You and know, you use the word genius, which is interesting. So do, does he notice stuff? Has he got a sort of palette where he'll observe stuff and, and point it out to you and you because you know with your experience you'd yeah. like that and it made me laugh just now when you said sort of customer feedback and things you need to work on and I think you'd have to be a pretty brave customer to come and tell you and Raymond that there was a few little tweaks that you'd like being made to the dishes but um, yeah does it does he notice things where you'll go oh my god yeah actually yeah he's, he's right he does he's these. got a phenomenal palate and that's that's what's lovely about it so you when you think it's good and you, you put it up if you can get it past RB you know it's bloody good do you know what I mean and that's the thing so all of the dishes we taste together, uh, which is great. And I also involve the junior team in that as well. How can we make this better? And that's what it's about. It's about being better tomorrow than you are today. Mm. And I think uh, he guides us with that and helps us with that. But he is a, a phenomenal force and good fun as well. He's, he's, uh, he's playful, he's, uh, he's good fun, and he's energetic, and he's, he's all of those things. Yeah. yeah. And I've, so I've seen him talk a couple of times. One, I think, was on the sustainability of fish, and I love it. I don't think it must be a nightmare to organise him to come and do a talk because I, I can't. I lost count of how many tangents he went off on, but the tangents were the best bit because he, he completely lost himself half the time, yeah. but was so, you know, the passion that he spoke with and, 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 and the belief from his heart yeah. and, and as he was getting more and more excited. And uh, yeah, I can't, uh, he was definitely way off topic, but you just think, yeah, what an amazing amount of, yeah. of energy and belief to have. You can see yeah. how, he, how, he, how he drives no, it. No, he's I an suppose. inspiration to so, so, so many generations of chefs. Yeah, yeah. okay. So just to sort of, you know, bring things to a close a little bit to talk about the future, really um, toughest time probably for hospitality, you know, ever, certainly in our living memories. I appreciate yeah. the country's been through wars and stuff. So yeah. presumably that would have been a tough time for, for going out in, into restaurants, but really difficult. What's your thoughts on, on what we've been through and how do you see things panning out? I suppose hard to know, but over the next sort of 12, 18 months, you must have spent some time thinking about it, not, not just for Le Manoir, but just for hospitality in general and what's happening out there. Yeah, I think it's going to be it's going to be really tough, and I think if there's, you know, I'm hoping a second wave doesn't happen, but you know, it, it, it's on the rise, and uh, there's obviously everyone is cautious, so I think um, yeah, we've just got to make sure that um, we're making good decisions, um, how we're acting, reacting, and, and and making keeping your customers safe. I think is the, is the main thing, and if people have got confidence in your business then you, you will still have customers. But it will affect a huge amount of people, particularly when the, um, you know, later on in the year when the, the government support stops for the, you know, the furloughed. Um, and if there is a second wave, you're going to see some redundancies and, and some places will fold. It's inevitable. There's, there's, no, um, there's no question of that. Um, but again, were there too many places in the beginning? Are there too many spots uh, to go to? With a shortage of chefs and lots and lots and lots of restaurants, you know, maybe that will, um, you know, naturally rebalance the, the status quo. Um, again, we've had a shortage of chefs, you know, across the country. There's always um, places for chefs. So maybe if there's less, a couple of less restaurants, maybe we can focus a little bit more on, on those that uh, get through that. But I think if you're a, a young chef, you've got to get into a, a place with the best possible training you can find and someone that's going to support you through your learning to get to where you're going basically which which is a good thing and solid foundations 
I think are key to anything. So I think if um, yeah, get into a, a good a good place and and that looks after you as mm. well. What do you think on the? Because because I, I agree with that sentiment that we, you know, there was an oversupply in the market. Yep. I think that the, the VCs had come along and backed this kind of incredible growth, I suppose, of of what you know arguably were either very successful places or, or were just a bit beige in it, and, and and sort of boards of directors ended up rolling out places. Any thoughts on is is it going to be? You kind of you know you you're smaller your your independence I suppose the the passionate that get through it or or realistically is it going to be the guys with with loads of shareholders stood behind the hospitality who who, who can keep it afloat for a couple of years What's your thoughts on where yeah. the industry ends up I suppose I don't think the top and the bottom will be affected It's the middle guys and the small little independents that will be um, hit But if the good small independents this is where again people need to go and support those you know the help out to reach out thing is one thing but I think when that you know passes are we going out to support those great little restaurants are we going out to support those those guys um, and those guys also have to you know do it in a, in a, in a safe way and it's, this is one thing that's starting we, but we've got to think about it for the future as well I think you'll see a surge in um, good quality takeaway food as well because you've got some fantastic restaurants with real a lot of skill and if we are stopped from letting people into our restaurants I think the um, you know the takeaway market will will come up particularly on plant-based i think that will be a, a big thing as well plant-based takeaway style food which again will hopefully keep every, but again you've got something home cooked as opposed to mass processed um because again in a pandemic we've got to be careful what we eat if we're less active you know you've got to be watching all of those things so good healthy takeaway food i think would be would be uh, something that some restaurants will focus on to get through the pandemic and those that are good at that will then keep the coffers ticking over to be able to open their restaurants when when the coast is clear mm. you know so they'll be the stronger guys those that can adapt um will get through this are yeah. we going to see le manoir on the back of a delivery bike anytime soon yeah. um not at this moment in time <laughs> and, I, and i hope i hope not i mean it'd be a shame not to share this because you know, if you look around it's a shame would, not for people to, get, yeah, but to come out. But I don't, I don't rule it out. I don't rule it out. The thing is, you've got to, you've got to make sure your team are busy yeah. and, and, and things are ticking over uh, financially as well in, in a good way. But again, if you can produce something that people are, are looking for, that's, that's yeah, important. And a lot of people, even at the... I mean, I, 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 that, it's not, not your niche in your area, albeit, you know, you've seen the likes of Hawksmoor, Adam Handling, I don't know, no, Mitch hasn't done it yet actually, has he? But you know, there's a lot of people focusing on that sort of home delivery of either ingredients or, yeah. or chef boxes, isn't there? So there yeah. is a, I would personally love it if there was a little uh, Gary and Raymond box that, that came through the door, but yeah. no plans at the minute. To but yeah, we, with these businesses as well, you've got you've got highly trained teams, you've got cold rooms, you've got um, you know, and you also got to look after your supplier as well. Mm. You just stop your supplier, you know, the, the supplier can keep on bringing you those those products which is great. You're keeping that family arm, arm of the family alive as well and, and keeping those things going. So people are doing that and, and turning to those things. And it's good because it's a good, healthy food that you can eat in your own space, mm. um, which, which is good. But lots of people are playing with that as well. And the, those, I, I say, that will adapt, will get through this and be on this. And that's it. That's important. And be stronger for it as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on a personal level then, black belt in karate, now yeah. becoming, you know, a yoga uh, centric person what, what what how do you continue to, you know here for 21 years anything on the horizon that keeps you motivated and, and what's your next kind of ambition i suppose or, or target um we we're looking at um you know developing the memoir um further you know possible spa we're looking at those things at the moment but again it's in the distance i'd rather talk about things that have happened rather than things that are planned um, so yeah, that's that's that would be the next uh, thing evolving the memoir. Um, yeah, well, you have got plenty of toys and plenty of space and plenty of stuff to do absolutely. here. Absolutely. Key thing. Thank you so much for sparing the time. You know, genuine, uh, real pleasure and and privilege to uh, to get to come and meet you. Uh, congratulations! It just blows my mind what what you guys have achieved here and and how many chefs you've pumped out. A thank you on behalf of everybody who enjoys food out there who gets to go and eat in in thirty yeah. other Michelin starred restaurants as a result of what you do. Um, where should people go if they want to follow you personally or, or Le Manoir? Is there a particular social channel or best place to go? Um, well, Le Manoir website is good. Raymond's website is is fantastic. I've got a tiny little. I don't do an awful lot on social. You know, Gary jo uh, Chef Gary Jones one, I think it is on on uh, Insta. A little bit is mainly from my garden, not not an awful lot on there because I don't have much time to do it, but there's a, a little bit on there. 
Twitter, same. Um, yeah, I don't have any website or anything like that, but if you need me, I'm getting, I'm, I'll be in the kitchen. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> great. Amazing. All right, well, we're going to go and have a little wander around your garden with a bit of luck, great. but thank you, uh, Gary. Really appreciate your time. Pleasure. Pleasure. Cheers. Take care. So there you have it, another awesome conversation with a true gentleman and legend of hospitality. My whole experience at Le Manoir was exemplary, apart from the fact they were shut for lunch on my visit. But the petty fours that I had with my coffee were delicious. What Raymond has created, particularly in the gardens at Le Manoir, has to be seen to be believed. My tour with Gary after we recorded the episode was fantastic and I'll put some photos up on my Patreon page so you can see what I'm talking about. Just head to humansofhospitality.co.uk and click on the Donate Now button to be taken to the Patreon page where you will find my post and behind the scenes shots. Whilst you are there, feel free to make a donation to keep this podcast on the air if you can. Also on the website, you'll find links through to Gary's Twitter and Instagram pages and a few links to Le Manoir as well. Thanks again for listening. Please don't forget to leave a review and I'll be back next Monday with a new conversation. Thanks.